Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Steven Roth and I'm a board certified oral and maxillofacial pathologist. And today we're going to observe how I recently worked up an unknown case. But first, the disclosure, and that is all of the opinions expressed in this video are mine and mine alone and do not represent any organization that I may be a part of that employs me or that I belong to professionally. And with that being said, let's get into today's video. So a little background on today's video, and that is that every year, the American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology has their annual meeting. And it's something that I really look forward to every year but due to the recent pandemic, the last two meetings have not been in person. So this year was a virtual meeting. Well, the meeting provides an opportunity for all of the oral and maxillofacial pathologists in the United States and a few internationally to come together to continue to learn in the profession. And there's a nice social aspect to it as well. But every meeting, there is a tradition and that is the CPC or Clinical Pathologic Correlation Session. And in that session, a unknown case is given to a newer pathologist, either a senior resident or a recent uh, graduate. And that person has to work up the case, meaning they have to come up with a differential diagnosis and ultimately a favor diagnosis. Uh, and the, they have to present their thought process to the academy. And then after that, the answer is revealed by the contributing pathologist, which is usually someone that is a little bit further along in the field with a little bit more expertise that was able to find the interesting case. So this year at the virtual conference, I was selected to discuss one of the cases and I was only given the history and also the imaging. So today I'll show you what I had prepared for the annual meeting so you can see exactly what my thought process was and maybe model your own approach to an unknown case based on what I did. And with that, take it away, Stephen. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Stephen Roth and I'm a member of the full-time oral pathology faculty at Northwell Health Long Island Jewish Medical Center and I'll be presenting CPC number two. This was the case history that I was given. This is a 52 year old male who reports a sense of facial pressure and increased difficulty breathing through the nose for the past eight months with occasional headaches. Imaging reveals a 5.2 centimeter greatest dimension polypoid mass within the nasopharynx and left posterior nasal cavity. Scope and clinical evaluation reveal no other pathology to include no lymphadenopathy. Here we have the first image that was given to me. This is a coronal bone window of a sinus CT, and we can appreciate that the septum is deviated to the left. There's minimal mucosal thickening of the floor of the maxillary sinuses, otherwise there's no other antral involvement. The left inferior nasal concha is asymmetrically larger than the right, and the left inferior nasal meatus is opacified and focally filled with gaseous bubbles. Here we have the second image, and I'd like to point out that the septum is likely present but appears missing due to volume averaging artifact. It's unlikely that this lesion is eroding the septum because the anatomic contours of the right nasal cavity are preserved and the lateral nasal wall is not remodeled or destroyed. Because of these findings, we can infer that there is no mass effect or bony destruction. This image helps us appreciate that this lesion is extending from the nasal cavity posteriorly through the nasal coena. This final axial soft tissue window of the sinus CT is at the level of the inferior nasal concha and it further shows that the origin is likely within the nasal cavity rather than the nasopharynx. This lesion appears to be squeezed out the left posterior nasal coena. There's no extension across the midline or into the maxillary sinuses, keeping within the confines of the left nasal cavity other than being pushed through the nasal coena. There's little to no bone resorption or remodeling. That was the information I was given. Obviously, there's more information that I'd want, including the remaining cuts of the CT, which would provide more context as to the true origin and full extent of the lesion. MRI without contrast showing both brain and sinus would better highlight relation with the soft tissue and better display the architecture of the lesion itself. We also need to rule out possible neurologic source of the patient's headache. A complete medical history would also be helpful, including other systemic conditions that this patient may have, if this patient has asthma, any history of travel, or any occupational considerations. Biopsy would obviously be the most preferred option, but what's the fun in that? Now we'll use these broad categories of pathologic entities to try to better elucidate what this lesion might actually represent. We could begin to start eliminating some of the broad categories. 
First, it's unlikely that this lesion is congenital. The patient is 52 and has only had symptoms in the last eight months. If this lesion was congenital, the patient would likely have presented earlier in life. Glial heterotopia would be a consideration if the patient was younger or was asymptomatic. While infection or allergy can be an underlying cause of inflammatory nasal polyps, specific infections such as rhinosporidiosis, rhinoscleroma, mucormycosis, and acute rhinosinusitis are usually significantly more destructive. I'm also excluding physical and chemical injury. These are usually significantly more destructive due to vascular collapse or structural collapse from either trauma or a chemical irritant such as certain narcotics. Let's consider some developmental or hamartomatous possibilities. One possibility is the respiratory epithelial adenomatoid hamartoma, or RIA. The majority of RIAs occur on the posterior nasal septum, have a male predominance, and occur in the third to ninth decade of life, all of which match our case. Another possibility is the serum mucinous hamartoma. Many believe that the serum mucinous hamartoma is possibly on a spectrum with RIA at the opposing end. These usually occur on the posterior nasal septum, or nasopharynx and I personally think that this image that I took from a case report matches our case pretty closely. To help improve my odds, and since the WHO suggests these lesions may lie in a spectrum, I'll be combining rhea and ceramucinous hamartoma, and now I'll talk about some metabolic or systemic considerations. Eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, or churg strauss is a vasculitis affecting small to medium-sized blood vessels. The triad is asthma, hyper-eosinophilia, and extravascular eosinophilic granulomas. One retrospective study found that half of patients had nasal polyposis, and half of those had diffuse polyposis filling the nasal cavity. The polyps may precede the asthma or vasculitis and occur often earlier in the disease course and have multiple recurrences. Our patient has no systemic symptoms that we know of, like flu-like symptoms or asthma, but this may be early in the disease course. Polyps can be multiple and may involve the sinuses, and sinuses often have some degree of opacification. Therefore, I don't necessarily favor Churg Strauss. It's important to note that granulomatosis with polyangiitis, also known as Wegner's granulomatosis, presents similarly, however, is much more destructive. Churg Strauss initially presents with polyps before the vasculitis, which can be destructive as the condition progresses. Cystic fibrosis is another consideration, and over 90% of patients with CF exhibit radiologic evidence of sinus mucosal involvement. Frontal sinus agenesis and maxilloethmoid sinus opacification occurs in greater than 75% of patients and is proposed as pathognomonic for cystic fibrosis. Our patient doesn't have sinus opacification and also doesn't have history of transplant. It's highly unlikely that a patient would remain undiagnosed into their 50s without needing attention for pulmonary or GI symptoms. Sarcoidosis of the upper respiratory tract occurs in up to 18% of patients, and when it occurs, it's more common in the nose than in the sinuses. Half of patients in one series had nasal symptoms before the diagnosis of sarcoidosis. A different series reports different prevalence of polyps ranging from 22% to 50%. Many of these patients with polyps have lupus perneo as well. However, the polyp in this patient could represent early sarcoid. Septal perforation is usually a later finding. Moving on to our inflammatory list. Inflammatory polyps are very common. They most commonly occur along the lateral nasal wall and can be associated with allergies, infections, and aspirin intolerance. A mulberry turbinate is a clinical term associated with hypertrophic turbinate tissue. Our case may represent an inflammatory polyp or a mulberry turbinate. And finally, we'll discuss neoplastic entities starting with benign. Sinonasal or Schneiderian papilloma. The inverted papilloma is usually cerebriform on MR and usually exhibits a lobulated surface pattern, while our lesion is more smooth surfaced. Inverted papillomas also frequently involve the middle meatus and can extend into the maxillary sinus rather than in an anterior posterior direction, as in our case. This image that on this slide happens to be an inverted papilloma shown in a bone window from a sinus CT. We can appreciate the scallop periphery and extension into the left maxillary sinus. Oncocytic papillomas are similar to inverted papillomas as that they are also lobulated and cerebriform on MR. Exophytic papillomas are excluded as it usually arises on the lower anterior nasal septum and our case clearly arises towards the posterior and extends posteriorly. 
Pleomorphic adenomas are exceedingly rare in the nose and represent less than 1% of all pleomorphic adenomas, and approximately 80% arise in the septal mucosa if they do arise in the sinonasal complex. Usually these lesions are unilateral, and while they do not destroy bone, we can appreciate in this image that there is bowing of the bone. Of the cases that I found, most are anterior towards the nares or piriform aperture and don't extend posteriorly through the posterior nasal coena, but this still deserves consideration. Neurofibromas arise most commonly from the nasal vestibule, followed by the maxillary sinus. It's important to note that this image, taken from a case report, is a rare presentation rather than the normal neurofibroma in the sinonasal complex. Less than 4% of schwannomas affect the nasal cavity and paranasal sinus, and when they occur, they most likely occur on the posterior septum. Schwannomas are usually inhomogeneous on imaging and can present with bone erosion and symptoms as severe as Horner syndrome. Lyomyomas in this location are usually angiolyomyomas or vascular lyomyomas. And the WHO lumps lobular capillary hemangioma, pyogenic granuloma, capillary hemangioma, and cavernous hemangioma all into the subcategory of hemangioma, so for the purposes of the CPC, I will as well. Incident peaks are adolescent males and pregnant women, of which our patient is neither. However, hemangiomas represent 25% of non-epithelial sinonasal tract neoplasms and deserve consideration. Now a borderline or intermediate lesion. Glomangiopericytomas represent less than one half of 1% of sinonasal neoplasms, 95% of which are unilateral and affect the nasal cavity alone, but frequently extend into paranasal sinuses. We can appreciate that in this example, there's remodeling and pushing of the nasal septum to the right side, a feature not seen in our lesion. And finally, we'll discuss some malignancies briefly. We won't be discussing malignancies that are usually destructive, like keratinizing and non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma, or affect a diff different demographic, like synovial sarcoma, which affects a younger age group. We'll be focusing on lower grade malignancies that are more likely to stay within the confines of the bone without erosion or invasion, and that fit the demographics of this patient. We can briefly consider both intestinal type and non-intestinal type adenocarcinomas. However, most of these cases exhibit destruction or at least bony remodeling, and our patient exhibits neither. Many salivary gland malignancies have been identified in the nasal cavity, all of which are exceedingly rare but deserve some consideration. No CPC would be complete without the great mimicker mucosal melanoma. This case happens to represent a 52-year-old man as well. A final list of the possibilities. Since I have to narrow it down to one diagnosis, I've decided to narrow it down to two, a horse and a zebra. My horse diagnosis is inflammatory polyp. My zebra diagnosis is rhea or seromucinous hamartoma. And like the zebra, I expect to be devoured by this lion of a case. I wanted to briefly acknowledge all of the wonderful mentors, both in New York and in Ohio, who helped me get to where I am today and thank the Academy for the opportunity to present this case. So there you have it. A big thank you to Dr. Mikkel Koenig at Insight Diagnostics in Spokane, Washington, who provided the case. And now I bet you're wondering how I did. So what was the answer? This lesion was actually a glomangiopericytoma, which I did mention, uh, but was not my favorite diagnostic, diagnosis. Now a glomangiopericytoma is thought to be derived from pericytes, and pericytes are cells that wrap around vessels and support them. There's a few theories as to what their natural functions are in the body, one of which is that they regulate the blood flow for temperature regulation, and another is that they help in angioneogenesis, or the creation of new blood vessels. Now, the glomangiopericytoma happens in the sinonasal complex, most commonly the nose, and it's actually very beautiful under the microscope. It looks like this streaming blue cells uh, with some intermixed staghorn or sparse vessels within it. And it is one of my favorite lesions as well. And I was thinking about guessing it, but in the end, went with my gut uh, and chose the, the selections that I did. Now, the glomangiopericytoma is an intermediate lesion, meaning that there is a very, very high likelihood of local recurrence but very limited metastatic potential and cause of death. So not quite benign, not quite malignant. So there you have it. Very often it's the oral pathologist that's trying to get you to come up with a differential, but now you get to see what happens when the tables are turned and the oral pathologist has to come up with the answer. So I hope that this was helpful in figuring out how you should approach an unknown case. And if you think this video is helpful, then please give it a thumbs up and subscribe and share it with someone else that might find it helpful as well. And with that, 
be well.